Thank you, Clay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining Dickinson State University and the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program as the TR Symposium is once again held on campus. My name is Trevor Conrad, like Clay said, and I'm a second generation DSU student and also the student assistant director of the TR Honors Leadership Program. I'm here to introduce your next speaker, Douglas W. Ellison. Doug Ellison was raised on a family ranch in North Dakota, located on the Cedar River and close to the South Dakota border. In 1906, this ranch was first settled by Paul Ellison, Doug's great-grandfather, who happens to also be my great-great-grandfather. The area where Grandpa Paul settled has greatly influenced Doug and myself in our passion for studying our family lineage and frontier history. This love of history has led to Doug's many professional works, including David Lant, The Vanished Outlaw, Soul Survivor, An Examination of the Frank Finkel Narrative, Journal of a Mountaineer, a compilation of memoirs of mountain man William T. Hamilton, and a number of articles and book reviews on Western biography, as well as being, featured, being a featured commentator on the History Ch Channel. Doug currently resides in Medora with his wife Mary and daughter Ashley, where he serves as mayor, authors in his spare time, and owns Western Edge books, artwork, and music. It brings me great pleasure to welcome not only a great historian, but also someone who has had a profound impact on my pursuit for historical knowledge, Mr. Doug Ellison. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, cousin. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, I think the mic is on, I'd like to thank uh, Clay, the Theodore Roosevelt Center, everyone connected with it for uh, inviting me here today. It's a great honor for me to be here uh, to speak on Theodore Roosevelt and frontier justice. Um, I'll, I'll try not to read too much, but I do like to use a lot of quotes, so please bear with me as I glance down. But Theodore Roosevelt was a man of many diverse attributes and many varied aspirations. He was an Easterner by chance and a Westerner by choice. Perhaps no, no part of his life has become so steeped in mythology as his Western experiences. He himself did much to promote this image of himself as a man of the West. He gained many impressive honors during his life, but one in which he took great pride and which he mentioned often was the simple title of Deputy Sheriff. He, uh, he used that phrase uh, a lot in his writings, which raises the question, was he indeed a working lawman? Did he indeed try to ride with vigilantes? Did he and the flamboyant Marquis de Mores, the founder of Medora, indeed almost fight a duel? Delving into these questions reveals a man who was, to borrow a phrase, a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction. First of all, did TR seek to ride with vigilantes? As the number of ranches increased dramatically in western Dakota and eastern Montana in the early 1880s, so too did rustling. A vigilante movement was already being discussed when TR, when TR became a ranchman in late 1883 but it did not materialize until the following year. Its guiding spirit was Cattle King Granville Stewart of Montana, who was also president of the Montana Stock Growers Association. The Little Missouri cattlemen, still unorganized, were affiliated with the Montana group. The shadowy group of vigilantes came to be contemporaneously known as the Montana Stranglers, for obvious reasons. They burst upon the scene in the first week of July, 1884, and they, or splinter groups, spent a busy few months dispensing summary justice on suspected stock thieves. It is written that the Marquis de Mores and Theodore Roosevelt beseeched Granville Stewart to allow them to ride with his vigilantes. The origin of this tale is difficult to determine, but the earliest reference source I have found is Herman Hagedorn's Roosevelt in the Badlands from 1921. While never claiming a personal role, T.R. does refer several times in his writings to the actions of vigilantes. In 1888, he summarized, During the last two or three years, the stockmen have united to put down all these dangerous characters, often by the most summary exercise of lynch law. Notorious bullies and murderers have been taken out and hung, while the bands of horse and cattle thieves have been regularly hunted down and destroyed in pitched fights by parties of armed cowboys. And as a consequence, most of our territory is now perfectly law-abiding. A little over two years ago, one committee of vigilantes in eastern Montana shot or hung nearly 60. Not, however, with the best judgment in all cases. 
Later that same year, he again made a direct reference to the Stranglers, writing, Bid remarked in passing that while the outcome of their efforts had been in the main wholesome, yet as is always the case in an extended raid of vigilantes, several of the 60-odd victims had been perfectly innocent men who had been hung or shot in company with the real scoundrels, either through carelessness and misapprehension or on account of some personal spite. TR also expanded on the justification of vigilanteism, such as it was, saying, cattle thieves are not common. Horse thieves, however, are always numerous and formidable on the frontier, though in our own country they have been summarily thinned out of late years. It is the fashion to laugh at the severity with which horse stealing is punished on the border, but the reasons are evident. Horses are the most valuable property of the frontiersman, whether cowboy, hunter, or settler, and are often absolutely essential to his well-being and even to his life. They are always marketable, and they are very easily stolen, for they carry themselves off instead of having to be carried. Horse stealing is thus a most tempting business, especially to the more reckless ruffians and it is always followed by armed men, and they can only be kept in check by ruthless severity. In his memoir, Granville Stewart implies that both the Marquis de Mores and Roosevelt were in attendance at the spring 1884 Mile City Stockman's meeting that discussed the wrestling problem, and that both de Mores and Roosevelt strongly supported vigilante action. Stewart date, dated this 1884 meeting as April 20th, whereas his modern biographer puts the date as March 21st, not being able to find a reference to that in the paper, I, in the contemporary Mile City and Medora newspapers, I finally found that the actual date was March 15th. At that time, neither the Marquis nor Roosevelt were anywhere near Dakota Territory. The Marquis was on an extended trip in the east, and TR would not come west for another two months, not arriving in Medora until June 9th. TR's early biographer, Herman Hagedorn, attempted to shoehorn the alleged meeting with Granville Stewart into TR's itinerary that summer, writing that the young Dakota firebrands made a special visit to Stewart to plead to be allowed to ride with his enforcers. This meeting, said Hagedorn, must have occurred during the last days of June. Hagedorn declared that the Marquis, Roosevelt, and an otherwise unidentified young Englishman named Jameson journeyed to Glendive, Montana to make their appeal to Stewart. A later TR biographer, Carlton Putnam, seemed to merge Stewart and Hagedorn and had the meeting occurring at Miles City. Stewart said Hagedorn was unimpressed by their passion. They were, he said, untrained, reckless, and uncontrollable, and they would get themselves killed for no reason. Most importantly, wrote Hagedorn, Stewart argued that they were all three of prominent families and would bring unwanted attention to the endeavor so dejected the three aspiring vigilantes returned to Dakota. Did such a dramatic meeting happen? The evidence indicates it did not. No contemporary evidence of such a journey has ever been found, and the confusion in location, whether Glendive or Miles City, does not bode well for the truth of the story. Most importantly, while tailoring the date to fit Roosevelt's calendar, Hagedorn failed to take note of the Marquis' busy schedule. During this time, the Marquis was again on an eastern journey of several weeks' duration. He left Medora on June 10th, the day after TR arrived there. The Marquis did not return to Medora until late on June 27th, but he left again for the east early the next morning. Roosevelt himself went east two days later on June 30th and would not return until the end of July, by which time the bulk of the vigilante work had already been done. Thus, it is doubtful that the Marquis and Roosevelt even saw each other until late summer. If they did meet in June, it could only have been once or twice in passing. The documented travels of the two Medora men that season simply do not allow any chance for them to have rendezvoused with Granville Stewart in Montana. The story of their expressed desire to ride with a lynch mob, at least as reported by Herman Hagedorn, is demonstrably false. It simply did not happen. Even without this definite evidence, rationality dictates that a novice ranchman like T.R. on only his second brief visit to the Badlands could hardly have expected such an intimate audience with one of the most powerful men in Montana. Despite his accomplishments back east, T.R. simply did not yet have a credible voice among the leading cattlemen of the region, especially on such a sensitive subject as vigilanteism. That would change, of course, but only with time. 
Not until two years later would T.R. feel confident enough to write to his sister, these Westerners have now pretty well accepted me as one of themselves. Another question, did T.R. and the Marquis de Mores nearly fight a duel? On June 26, 1883, more than two months before T.R. arrived at Little Missouri for the first time, a group of men led by the Marquis de Mores engaged in a gun battle with three hunters, resulting in the death of one of the hunters, William Riley Lufsey. Released after two preliminary hearings, the Marquis was eventually indicted for Lefsey's murder two years later, in August of 1885. In early September, from his jail cell in Bismarck, the Marquis wrote a letter to Roosevelt, saying, My dear Roosevelt, my principle is to take the bull by the horns. Joe Ferris is very active against me and has been instrumental in getting me indicted by furnishing money to witnesses and hunting them up. The papers also publish very stupid accounts of our quarreling. I sent you the paper to New York. Is this done by your orders? I thought you my friend. If you are my enemy, I want to know it. I am always on hand, as you know, and between gentlemen, it is easy to settle matters of this sort directly. Yours very truly, Morez. He then added a mollifying postscript. I hear the people want to organize the county. I am opposed to it for one year more at least. Roosevelt received this letter while at Medora for the meeting of the Little Missouri River Stockmen's Association. His reaction indicates that he was aware of the Marquis' rumored record as a duelist in Europe. Bill Sewell, foreman of Roosevelt's Elkhorn Ranch, later wrote that Roosevelt showed him the letter. Sewell's account makes clear that TR did not consider this letter itself a challenge to a duel, but he thought that it might lead to a confrontation. Sewell wrote, Roosevelt read me the letter and said that he regarded it as that the Marquis would perhaps challenge him. If he did, he should accept the challenge, for he would not be bullied. He said that his friends would all be opposed to his fighting a duel and that he was opposed to dueling himself. But if he was challenged, he should accept. That would give him the choice of weapons. He would choose Winchester rifles and have the distance arranged at 12 paces. He did not consider himself a very good shot, and he wanted to be near enough so he could hit. They would shoot in advance until one or the other was satisfied. He told me that if he was challenged, he wanted me to act as his second. Roosevelt then crafted a masterfully diplomatic reply to the Marquis, saying, Most emphatically, I am not your enemy. If I were, you would know it, for I would be an open one, and I would not have asked you to my house nor gone to yours. As your final words, however, seem to imply a threat, it is due to myself to say that the statement is not made through any fear of possible consequences to me. I too, as you know, am always on hand and ever ready to hold myself accountable in any way for anything I have said or done. Very truly yours, Theodore Roosevelt. The Marquis' answer to this does not exist, although Sewell remembered it as an apology with the Marquis writing that there was, quote, always a way to settle misunderstandings between gentlemen without trouble, unquote. The thorough Roosevelt biographer Carlton Putnam carefully examined this event and he concluded that a duel would not have occurred, and I agree. When the Marquis did challenge a man to a duel, he left no doubt in anyone's mind, as detailed by Black Hills pioneer A.M. Willard in 1934. After denying the possibility of a roosevelt Demores duel, Willard divulged a story that he said has never before been given to the public. While not giving a year, it could only have been April 1886 when Willard declared that he rode from Deadwood to Medora, where he joined his brother, Deputy U.S. Marshal Fred Willard, the Marquis de Mores, and Theodore Roosevelt in traveling by rail to the huge Montana Stockmen's Association meeting at Miles City. Willard declared in vivid detail, as soon as we arrived at Miles City, a card was sent me from the Miles City Club inviting me to be a guest. I accepted, of course. Roosevelt and Demores were members of the club, I believe. I found that the club was made up largely of big cattlemen. One day I spent most of the day at the club as it was raining and very unpleasant outside. I had noticed a large man in the next room who was making himself conspicuous by his loud and very vulgar language. He seemed to have a great deal to say about what he termed the Marquis, that damn fool Frenchman, who at the time was building a slaughter, slaughterhouse at Medora to enter into competition with the big eastern packers. While he was saying some very unpleasant things about the Frenchman, the Marquis entered. 
He very deliberately took off his raincoat, placed it on a chair, and then sat down next to me and commenced talking to me while the loudmouth party was in the next room. The door was wide open and we could hear everything that was being said. Finally, the noisy man said something reflecting on the ancestry of the Marquis. The Frenchman jumped to his feet at once and seizing his wet gloves, went up to the man and struck him a violent blow across the face with his gloves, nearly blinding him. Then quickly stepping back, he quietly said, I am the Marquis de Morris, sir. What do you want? Turmoil ensued, said Willard, with he and his lawman brother Fred springing to the Marquis's side. A challenge was made and accepted, with the Marquis specifying pistols at 25 yards. The contest was called off, however, when the Marquis's opponent somewhat sobered up and learned of the Marquis's shooting record. The man offered an apology to the Marquis, who responded, I am obliged to accept your apology, but I shall refuse to shake hands with you, as you are no gentleman. Willard stated that this closed the incident and that Theodore Roosevelt was in the midst of all this excitement, and it is said was excited as anyone to see the duel they expected to witness. This incident occurred seven months after T.R. and the Marquis' letter exchange. It would be interesting to know T.R.'s thoughts on the incident, but only A.M. Willard ever mentioned it nearly half a century later. Apparently, what happened in the Mile City Club stayed in the Mile City Club. In fact, in all of his voluminous writings, T.R. made only a couple of oblique references to the Marquis de Morez. It was left to a former Black Hills newspaper editor, Kenneth Harris, to report T.R.'s only detailed statement regarding the Marquis. Kenneth Harris was in Cuba covering the Spanish-American War in 1898. Because of his former residence in Western Dakota in the 1880s, it must have been Harris himself who lobbed a loaded question to T.R. Harris wrote from Cuba, I believe that there is more storytelling around a soldier's campfire than in any other place in the world. Colonel Roosevelt is a good storyteller, and whether he is talking of his little Missouri ranch experiences or of the humors of a New York police court, he always has a large and interested audience. One night he was speaking of the Marquis de Mores. It was like living with a cotton-mouthed adder to be with him, Roosevelt said, exciting and interesting, but not very pleasant. An intensely spectacular man, dramatic. He would receive an anonymous note warning him not to go by a certain butte where he could never by any possibility have had any intention of going, that assassins were concealed there waiting for him. Forthwith, the Marquis would festoon himself with pistols and knives, mount his coal black horse and ride round and round that butte, glaring into the darkness. People fleeced him and humbugged him right and left. He wanted to join the Apaches at one time. They appealed to him as a noble and oppressed race. They would have eaten him. <laughs> Left unanswered as if Roosevelt meant that closing quote to be taken literally. Another question. Roosevelt is deputy sheriff. Probably T.R.'s most famous exploit in Dakota was his pursuit in March and April 1886 of the three miscreants who had stolen his boat. The story is well known and will be covered here only in general terms. The Little Missouri River was high with spring runoff when Roosevelt and his Elkhorn ranchmen, Bill Sewell and Wilmot Dow, discovered that their boat had been stolen. T.R. was incensed and was determined to follow the thieves downriver. T.R. later explained his motive and his philosophy of frontier justice. The determining motive in our minds was neither chagrin nor anxiety to recover our property. In any wild country where the power of the law is little felt or heeded, and where everyone has to rely upon himself for protection, men soon get to feel that it is in the highest degree unwise to submit to any wrong without making an immediate and resolute effort to avenge it upon the wrongdoers, at no matter what the cost of risk or trouble. To submit tamely and meekly to theft or to any other injury is to invite almost certain repetition of the offense in a place where self-reliant hardihood and the ability to hold one's own under all circumstances rank as the first of virtues. Within a few days, Sewell and Dow experienced Woodman and built a new boat, and the three Avengers started down the Little Missouri. To their surprise, on the third day, they came upon the three men near the mouth of Cherry Creek, where an ice jam had delayed their progress. Roosevelt, Sewell, and Dow were able to get the drop on the three cold and hungry outlaws, and the group was then forced to delay as the ice went out. After eight days, T.R. determined that his men would take the two boats downriver to Mandan and then come back west by rail uh, to Medora, while he himself would march the three prisoners overland to Dickinson. 
It was indeed a, indeed a long and tiring but uneventful two-day march to Dickinson where T.R. presented his prisoners to Justice of the Peace, Western Star. Great name. Amazingly, this is almost incredible, Theodore Roosevelt, Western Star, and W.L. Crosby, owner of the Diamond Sea Ranch where Roosevelt and the prisoners had just spent the previous night, were all three former classmates at Columbia Law School in New York City. You can't make this up. No one, no one would believe it. But uh, Roosevelt Starr and Crosby had all been classmates in New York, and they all end up out here in the middle of Dakota Territory to take part in this adventure. As an aside, the names of the three prisoners were Michael Finnegan, Edward Bernstead, and Chris Pfaffenbach. T.R. later asked the court not to prosecute Pfaffenbach, an older man, saying that he was merely a follower and was not responsible for his actions. Pfaffenbach thanked Roosevelt profusely, causing T.R. to later say it was the first time anyone had ever thanked him for calling them a fool. <laughs> Finnegan and Bernstead were each sentenced to the territorial penitentiary for terms of 25 months for the theft of the boat. Getting back to the actual uh, event itself, a few days later a local Dickinson resident sent a letter to an eastern paper declaring I had never seen Mr. Roosevelt before, although I had read many articles from his pen. And when I left home, I had no idea of meeting a gentleman of his standing on the frontier masquerading in the character of an impromptu sheriff. T.R. wrote in 1888 that after delivering the three prisoners to Dickinson, under the laws of Dakota, I received my fees as a deputy sheriff for making the three arrests, and also mileage for the 300 odd miles gone over, a total of some $50. Well, T.R. considerably padded his mileage total, unless he was also including the longer journey of Sewell and Dow to Mandan, which may be possible. Research has thus far failed to uncover which entity actually paid Roosevelt for his services. Billings County, where the theft had occurred, had not yet been organized, and the Stark County records at Dickinson do not reflect any such payment. The Morton County records at Mandan for that time period are apparently lost. Thus, if Roosevelt indeed had legal standing as a deputy sheriff, it would appear to have been under the authority of Morton County. It has often been written that T.R. held a deputy sheriff's commission by virtue of his chairmanship of the Little Missouri River Stockmen's Association. The origin of this tradition is hard to trace. If true, it was apparently only a verbal commission by a local sheriff, for no written documentation of such authority has ever been found. This single and worthy experience did gain for Roosevelt the status of a frontier lawman. In coming years, however, he would embellish his credentials quite shamelessly, often remarking that he served at various and sundry times as the deputy sheriff. As an example, T.R. expounded on the fine art of manhunting in his 1913 autobiography. While serving as deputy sheriff, I was impressed with the advantage an officer of the law has over ordinary wrongdoers, provided he thoroughly knows his own mind. There are exceptional outlaws, men with a price on their heads and of remarkable prowess, who are utterly indifferent to taking human life, and whose warfare against society is an, as open as that of a savage on the warpath. The law officer has no advantage whatever over these type of men, save what his own prowess may or may not give him. But the ordinary criminal, even when murder, murderously inclined, feels just a moment's hesitation as to whether he cares to kill an officer of the law engaged in his duty. I took in more than one man who was probably a better man than I was with both rifle and revolver, but in each case I knew just what I wanted to do, whereas the fraction of a second that the other man hesitated put him in a position where it was useless for him to resist. Such claims by T.R. were not new, for in a lengthy 1903 letter to his Secretary of State, John Hay, he described his just completed presidential tour of the West. Roosevelt reminisced about having arrested two other outlaws, one, quote, a half-breed horse thief, unquote, named Lippy Slim. T.R. wrote that Lippy Slim had later been hanged by Granville Stewart's vigilantes. Well, T.R. was still a bad underfoot, of course, when the Stranglers disbanded nor has extensive research revealed the slightest other reference to a, uh, an outlaw named Lippy Slim. T.R.'s other arrest, he said, was of, quote, a rather well-meaning but worthless young fellow named Calamity Joe, unquote. 
Calamity Joe was indeed a somewhat notorious character in Western Dakota during Roosevelt's ranching days. His real name was Joseph C. Meyer. And as TR would point out, Joe's uncle, Charles Dietrich, was later a United States Senator from Nebraska from 1901 to 1905. TR first wrote of Calamity Joe in 1888 when detailing his arrest of the boat thieves. TR declared that as the captors and captives talked around the fire one night, somebody had been speaking of a man whom we all knew, known as Calamity, who had recently been taken by the sheriff on a charge of horse stealing. Calamity had escaped once, but was caught at a disadvantage the next time. Nevertheless, when summoned to throw up his hands, he refused and attempted to draw his own revolver, with the result of having two bullets put through him. This story was true, for in February 1886, Calamity had escaped from the Deadwood Jail before Deputy U.S. Marshal Fred Willard of Medora could retrieve him. A few days later, Calamity showed up at Glen, at Glen Ullen, Dakota, and was confronted by Sheriff Sebastian and Deputy Gowdy of Stark County, and was shot twice while resisting arrest, just as Roosevelt said. News of this capture went out over the wire service and appeared in newspapers all across the country, including the front page of the New York Times. One must wonder if Roosevelt, at home in New York, read it. Roosevelt did not figure in either of Calamity's arrests, nor in 1888 did he make such a claim. Yet in his private 1903 letter to John Hay, Roosevelt did claim the arrest as his own, adding, I took Joe down to Mandan, and the night before the trial, he and the judge and I all slept in one room with two beds. And as the judge felt it undignified to sleep with a horse thief, he slept with me instead. It proved afterwards that Calamity was a nephew of Senator Dietrich. In his 1913 autobiography, Roosevelt again claimed to have arrested Calamity Joe, although this time he wrote, the man went by a nickname, which I will call Crazy Steve. The fact that Crazy Steve also had an uncle who was a U.S. Senator clearly establishes his identity as Calamity Joe Meyer. Perhaps T.R. felt the need to replace one colorful nickname with another because some people would know or would find out that he had never arrested Calamity Joe. Joe was arrested only twice at Deadwood and Glen Allen in early 1886, and T.R. was not present at either event, despite his later claims. Calamity Joe Meyer, following his youthful indiscretions, uh, became a respected rancher in western North Dakota, near Sentinel Butte, dying in 1943. Roosevelt was newsworthy, and any arrest he made would definitely have made the newspapers, if not the official county records. The silence in these sources confirms that the only arrests T.R. ever made were of the three boat thieves in April 1886, despite his later claims to the contrary. So what were Roosevelt's views on frontier justice? T.R. held a romanticized vision of the frontier, and experiencing what he called life reduced to its elemental conditions was a major motivation in bringing him west as a young man. Among T.R.'s earliest impressions of the so-called Wild West were those given in a newspaper interview in July 1884. Roosevelt said, if a man minds his own business and at the same time shows that he is fully prepared to assert his rights, if he is neither a bully nor a coward, and if he keeps out of places in which he has no business to be, he will get along as well as he would on, on Fifth Avenue. There are many places in our cities where I would feel less safe than I would among the wildest cowboys of the West. Four years later, T.R. offered a similar sentiment. A man has very little more to fear in the West than in the East, in spite of all the lawless acts one reads about. If a man minds his own business and does not go into bar rooms, gambling saloons, and the like, he need, he need have no fear of being molested. While a revolver is a mere foolish encumbrance for any but a trained expert and need never be carried. T.R.'s last position was shared by many newspaper editors in the West, including his friend Arthur T. Packard of Medora's Badlands Cowboy. Packard recalled that whenever Roosevelt came to Medora, he would deposit his weapons in Packard's office. Life on the border was not life in the city. Causes and effects were very different, but eventually, as society like children grew, changes came and rules of conduct were enforced. T.R. repeatedly stressed the individualism and self-sufficiency of the Westerner. Their ability, indeed their need, of meeting and dealing with adversity on their own terms. In his writings, a reader will look in vain for any phrase akin to, he should have gone after the sheriff. 
Roosevelt's West is replete with tales of men who relied on their own resources to protect their lives and property. The law, when mentioned at all, is merely a distant abstraction. In 1888, Roosevelt wrote of the roughs and criminals who always gather on the outskirts of civilization and who infest every frontier town until the decent citizens become sufficiently numerous and determined to take the law into their own hands and drive them out. He offered a similar sentiment five years later. As soon as communities become settled and begin to grow with any rapidity, the American instinct for law asserts itself. But in the earlier stages, each individual is obliged to be a law unto himself and to guard his rights with a strong hand. This was, T.R. was saying, the natural order of things. When established law did not exist or was impotent to act, the law of self was necessary and predominant. While acknowledging that there, quote, there were certain offenses such as rape, the robbery of a friend, or murder under circumstances of cowardice and treachery, which were never forgiven, unquote, T.R. seems almost apologetic for the vast majority of Western lawbreakers. Much of it was, he seems to say, a case of boys will be boys. He seems, non, he seems quite non-judgmental about the frolics of workaday cowboys, even when they cross that vague line into lawlessness. They're in the main good men, insisted T.R., and the disturbance that they cause in a town is done from sheer rough lightheartedness. They shoot off boot heels or tall hats occasionally, or make some obnoxious butt dance by shooting about his feet, but they rarely meddle in this way with men who have not themselves played the fool. A fight in the streets is almost always a duel between two men who bear each other malice. It is only in the general melee in a saloon that outsiders often get hurt. And then it's their own fault, for they had no business to be there anyway. Most gunmen fought among themselves. And, concluded T.R., it is a noteworthy fact that the men who are killed generally deserve their fate. Lest anyone misunderstand, T.R. clarified, Now I suppose some good people will gather from all this that I favor men who commit crimes. I certainly do not favor them. I'm glad to see wrongdoers punished. The punishment is an absolute necessity from the standpoint of society. And I put the reformation of the criminal second to the welfare of society. But I do desire to see the man or woman who has paid the penalty and who wishes to reform given a helping hand. T.R.'s tales often reflect the raw humor that was emblematic of life in rough and indelicate conditions. A typical example is a story that he claimed to have heard while overnighting at a distant ranch. Lying in his bunk, T.R. listened to a conversation between two young cowboys concerning the fate of a noted cutting horse. It had been stolen, said one of them, and he had tracked the thief to a place called Cedar Town. As T.R. later told the story, the cowboy declared, there was a boom on the town and it looked pretty slick. There was two hotels and I went into the first and I says, where's the justice of the peace, says I to the bartender. There ain't no justice of the peace, says he. Justice of the peace got shot. Well, where's the constable, says I. Well, it was him that shot the justice of the peace, says he. And he skipped the country with a bunch of horses. Well, ain't there no officer of the law left in this town, says I. Well, of course there is, says he. There's a probate judge. He's over tending bar at the Last Chance Hotel. So I went over to the Last Chance Hotel and I walks in there. Morning, says I. Morning, says he. You're the probate judge, says I. That's what I am, says he. What do you want, says he. I want justice, says I. What kind of justice do you want, says he. What's it for? It's for stealing a horse, says I. Then by blank, that's what you'll get, says he. Who stole the horse, says he. It's a man that lives in an adobe house just outside town here, says I. Well, where do you come from yourself, says he. From Medora, says I. With that, he lost interest and settled kind of back and says he, there won't no Cedartown jury hang a Cedartown man for stealing a Medora man's horse, says he. Well, what am I to do about my horse, says I. Do, says he. Well, you know where the man lives, don't you, says he. Sit up outside his house tonight and shoot him when he comes in and then skip out with the horse. All right, says I, that's just what I'll do. And I walked off. So I went over to his house and I laid down behind some sage brushes to wait for him. He was not at home, but I could see his wife moving around inside now and again. And I waited and waited, and it grew darker. And I began to say to myself, now here you are, laying out here to shoot this man when he comes home, and it's getting dark, and you don't know him. And if you do shoot the next man that comes to that house, like as not, it won't be the fellow you're after at all. 
but some perfectly innocent man coming to see the other man's wife. So I just saddled up the bronc and I lit out for home. The man was, said T.R., justly proud of his insightful reasoning. Thank you all. <laughs> wow. Wow. All I can say is, wow, are you a downer? So, <laughs> so you're myth busting. You're up here yeah, myth busting. Well, so it, it was. I, I was actually quite surprised when I started digging into this. And there are other other examples too. I hate to. I'm going to bring a couple up, but you know, first of all, so to the best of your judgment, was he or was he not actually a deputy sheriff? Uh, one time, the the boat thief chase is is all I can document. But he hadn't been declared one. That wasn't that a citizen's arrest. Uh, that, that's uh, I've, I've uh, debated that with, with some people uh, who I thought may know. Nobody really seems to know. Uh, he uh, obviously, when, when, the, when the theft occurred, when the boat theft occurred, they were out on the Elkhorn Ranch. Uh, they started in immediate pursuit. They did not have a warrant. There were no uh, you know warrants for these men for stealing his boat. There may have been other warrants out for them, but. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, which leads to the uh, question of was he, by virtue of chair chairing the Little Missouri River Stockman's Association, did he have authority as a deputy sheriff? That's been written by a number of his biographers, and uh, I can't find the source for that. They, they don't reference it. At least I've never found the reference. Uh, so again, if, if he had uh, legal authority by virtue of his chairmanship of the Stockman's Association, it must have been just a a verbal commission by a sheriff. Uh, the courthouses have nothing, nothing written authorizing Roosevelt as a deputy sheriff. He was never paid as a deputy sheriff, which others were. I, I checked the Medora, the Dickinson courthouses. Uh, deputy sheriffs were often, you know, paid their monthly fee. Uh, the name Theodore Roosevelt does never appear there. So I, I think, in effect, uh, Clay, I think it was a citizen's arrest. And uh, after he marched him into Dickinson here, he finally swore out the warrants for the theft of his boat. And he said he was paid as a deputy sheriff, but it was retroactive, apparently. But, I mean, you have Dr. Victor Hugo Stickney, after whose daughter this very room is named, saying, quote, he was masquerading in the character of an impromptu sheriff. So that sounds like he knew that he wasn't actually a lawman. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, we, when that phrase appeared, it was uh, masquerading as an impromptu sheriff, which apparently is as close as he ever got to legal standing. And if I can, if I can interject, uh, Roosevelt talked a lot about uh, Bill Jones. Uh, hell Roaring. Foul mouth Bill Jones, or was that also Hell, hell Roaring right? Bill Jones. Hell Roaring Bill Jones. He had a couple of nicknames. Um, Roosevelt said, uh, and Jones was actually Billings County Sheriff from uh, 1889 to 1895. And he also worked for Roosevelt at the Elkhorn. And, and Roosevelt wrote that it was, it was kind of a strange situation because uh, he said, Bill Jones worked for me at the ranch and I, I served under him as a deputy sheriff. Well, well, again, Jones was sheriff from 1889 to 1895. And at that point, uh, Roosevelt was in and out of the Badlands only a few days at a time just hunting trips mainly. And uh, I, I can't imagine, you know, Jones would say, well, I'm glad you're here. Here's some warrants. Go out and serve them. Uh, that just didn't happen. So uh, if, if Bill Jones did deputize Roosevelt, it was, it, it was apparently a verbal commission like, Clay, I deputize you. You know, now you're a deputy. And <laughs> but the, I mean, the usual understanding of Roosevelt in the West is that he was a embellisher, but not a liar. And you're saying, no, he was a liar. He, he did not tell the truth in, in certain cases. But I mean, why would you make up a character called Libby Slim? I mean, what, what's in it for Roosevelt Libby to, Slim. to yeah. create Libby Slim? I don't know. Uh, I think you know, you're I... making this stuff up. So, <laughs> why, why would Granville Stewart, who was a very distinguished man, yeah. say that Roosevelt and the Marquis came out and begged to be part of the Stranglers and he saw that they were too prominent and too reckless. And so why would he make that story up if there's no historical basis for well, it? Well, actually, there's, there's a fine line there. Granville Stewart uh, 
made it sound like Roosevelt and the Marquis were at the spring 1884 meeting. Right. Which they weren't. They weren't even in Dakota Territory at the time. And it's the earliest source I found is Herman Hagedorn, who says the Marquis and Roosevelt and this Englishman named Jameson, who I may, maybe you have heard of him. I never yes. have, but uh, it was Hagedorn who said they made a special trip into Montana. It wasn't the Stockman's meeting. Just for this purpose. Says. Yeah, they made a special appeal to Stewart. They, they, they went to see him. One biographer said Glendive, another said Miles City. But they made a special trip into Montana to appeal to Granville Stewart, please let us ride with the Stranglers. And, uh, and, and Hagedorn has Stewart saying, no, no, you guys are basically saying you're too well known and you talk too much. Can't let you do it. Uh, Stewart never made the claim. He made it sound like they were at the spring 1884 Stockman's meeting, which, which they weren't. But, and, and, and some of you may know more on this than I do, but if, if you know of a source earlier than Hagedorn, 1921, please let me know. But that's the earliest I've found where Hagedorn has the Marquis and Roosevelt and the other man making a special trip into Montana to beseech Granville Stewart to please let us ride with your vigilantes. So maybe there's some confusion about whether they went to Miles City and under what circumstances and under what date. But you're saying there's actually no reason to believe they ever went at all. Right. I, I don't think they ever went at all. And so, the, so Stewart makes this up. It could, uh, well, yeah, or he was wrong. Uh, when, he, when he put them... <laughs> yeah, how could you be wrong? You either, I mean, he knew either well, they had come to him or not. No, no. See, Stewart, Stewart never, never claimed they came to him personally. That was Hagedorn. H Hagedorn said Stewart said. Stewart. Yeah, yeah, Hagedorn is quoting Stewart. Right. But I don't know that Stewart ever said it. Hagedorn so said Hagedorn is making Hagedorn things, said right. Stewart said it, but I'd like to go to the primary source. Right, so in, in, in Stewart's memoir, he does not make that claim. I don't even know if I want to go on here. Uh, so on the boat incident itself, which we're doing tomorrow morning, right. and you see these photographs, they steal his boat. His own men build a, a makeshift boat. They follow them down and arrest them. They're eight days uh, on the river trying to get down to Mandan. Can't do it. Comes to a ranch, gets uh, some food, then starts to march them overland. They come to the Diamond Sea Ranch, the Crosby Ranch. They get a wagon and a, and a drover of some sort, and then he marches them about 40 miles overland. Mm -hmm. Is any of that, to your mind, not true? No, that is accurate. That was reported in the newspapers. That's very accurate. And so you, you're believing that story. Yeah. Now, Roosevelt embellished the story over time, but you're not denying any of that story. Right, that did happen. Okay, so now to the famous, well, go ahead. No, I, I was going to just reiterate that, that that is the only documented case of Roosevelt ever arresting anyone. The, the other arrests he claimed, Lippy Slim and Calamity, Calamity Joe. Joe slash uh, Crazy Steve, uh, didn't, it's not documented, it didn't, didn't happen. This is the autobiography of a former president of the United States, and, you're, <laughs> and you are saying he's making this up. He, he did. Yeah. All right, this is... Keep your skepticism uh, high. Now, <laughs> all right, so, so let's go to the, the other famous incident, the, the, the punching out of the drunk in the bar in, in, in Mingusville, Weibo. Is that story true? Um, you know, it was, it was never contemporaneously documented. No, no newspapers ever reported that, not necessarily that they would have. But I'm... Um, if I can uh, get this accurate now, uh, Roosevelt uh, made that claim in, in his 1903 letter to John Hay. He talks right. about punching out the drunk, and he wrote about it too in, in, in his articles. But he doesn't call it Mingusville uh, or Weibo. He, he just says in a, in a homely frontier town or something to that effect. And a guy named uh, Frank Green, I should have been better prepared for this question. Uh, a guy named Frank Green, who lived in Grand Forks, read Roosevelt's autobiography in 1913. The, the, the book came out in 1913. A year or two later, Green read it. And he, and he read about this incident that Roosevelt wrote about. And Green was a, a Northern Pacific Railroad official. And uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. That. Um, let me, I'll get back to, to the bully incident, but interconnected with that is a, an episode in Mingusville where three cowboys, one of whom was Bill Fallas, who later became Stark County Sheriff here in Dickinson, but they were just kids at the time. Three cowboys, one of whom was Bill Fallas. They were kids, they were 20 years old, they were drunk. 
the train came into Mingusville and they shot at the conductor's feet. And uh, all it did was make the conductor angry. I'll use the polite phrase, made him angry. And he, uh, he went to Frank Green, his superior on the railroad, and reported this. Well, Frank Green charged these three unfortunate cowboys with obstructing the U.S. mail by, by detaining the conductor. Serious charge. Uh, they were each eventually fined $100, which on cowboy pay was a pretty stiff fine. But Roosevelt wrote about that in his autobiography. And here's another case. Roosevelt says uh, he's, he was there when it happened. He was in bed with Bill Fallis on the cot in the hotel with Bill Fallis when the lawmen came in in the middle of the night, pulled Bill Fallis. Right. He was going by the name Bill Jones, but they, they pulled Fallis out of bed next to Roosevelt and took him away. And Roosevelt says to the other sleepers, he says, uh, where are they taking Bill? Nobody would answer him, where are they taking Bill? And they finally told him, uh, mind your own business. You know, So that was Roosevelt's story in his autobiography. Well, when this... When this event actually happened, it was in February of 1886. Roosevelt was in New York when, when this happened. He wasn't in the cot next to Bill Fallis. He was in New York. <laughs> and uh, anyway, back to Frank Green. Frank Green read, read this in his autobiography, and he, he wrote to Roosevelt, and he says, well, I had no idea you were so closely connected with this event, because he said, that was me that ordered the arrest of these cowboys. And, uh, <laughs> and Green, this is in the newspaper, and Green says, I reminded Roosevelt that it was in Mingusville, because he hadn't named the town. And Roosevelt wrote back and said, yes, of course it was. And uh, he said, uh, he said in the same, uh, Roosevelt said, in, in the same hotel is where I, where I uh, hit the, the bully, in the same hotel. Well, in his autobiography that he just wrote a couple years earlier, he Roosevelt specifically, he mentioned the, the shooting incident I just talked about, but he said, in a similar hotel, I once punched out a bully. In a similar hotel, and now he's telling Green, that was the very same hotel where I punched out the bully. So uh, there's, there's, all, there's all, and I'm not, I don't mean to demean Roosevelt, obviously, but, That's but in, re clear. In, re in researching his writings, I mean, there's uh, an, an attorney, and we have attorneys here, they would delight in examining him and you said it this way this time, and you said it this way this time, and you said it this way this time. Don't even start down that path. You know, <laughs> we're, we're trying him tonight for other crimes, not, not whoppers. Let's, let's add to this to the... Let's uh, he walks into a bar, a saloon in, in Mingusville, in a western town, and confronts... Uh, there's a, a drunken gunslinger with a pistol in either hand shooting up the bar. Roosevelt tries to avoid his notice. The man sees him and says, oh, there's four eyes. He'll stand drinks for the bar. Uh, Roosevelt tries to slink back to an obscure table. The, uh, the drunken gunslinger pursues him and stands right over him. Roosevelt remembers that he's got some um, capacity as a boxer. He knocks him out. Both guns go off. Roosevelt is not killed. He jumps on the stomach, on the chest of this ruffian, disarms him. They put him on a freight train. You're saying there's no special reason to believe that's all true. Uh, it's, it's not documented other than Roosevelt's But you're just saying words. that Roosevelt is prone to make up stories about his time in the West. Uh, I'll, I'll take him at his word on that. <laughs> All right. I, so, I will. Uh, the, the only time I doubt Roosevelt is when there's, when there's actual other, truth. Other, <laughs> other, evidence, other evidence that goes against his version, mainly contemporary evidence going against what he said. Have you then I have to doubt him. Have you published these? No. You should, actually. You this, should. this is a, the first time it's ever been heard. <laughs> you're, you're fortunate to see the destruction of one of our greatest men here. Uh, who has a question for this ruffian? Yes. Roosevelt's relationship with Seth Bullock. Yes. Uh, they, uh, they first met in 1892. Uh, Seth Bullock uh, was a lawman in the Black Hills. And uh, in 1892, uh, or three, I think 1892, Roosevelt and Bill Jones, who we talked about earlier, were uh, met Bullock in a group uh, between Medora and Deadwood. And the story goes that, uh, and, and I, I think this is, I don't know if this is from Roosevelt or Bullock, but I don't doubt this, but they met on the trail and introductions were made, and Roosevelt at that time was civil service commissioner, and, and Initially, Bullock had been somewhat suspicious of these uh, dusty, trail-worn travelers, and 
Bullock said, well, anyone who's civil goes with me. So they became very close friends. And uh, I think Bullock uh, was later appointed U.S. Marshal, I believe, by President Roosevelt. But, but they remained very close. Uh, Bullock went to the White House. Uh, T.R. would send his, his sons out west to, to stay with Bullock and hunt and learn to be cowboys. Uh, but they had a very close relationship. And two of the sons, Kermit and Ted, were sent out specifically to Deadwood to, be, to spend summers with Bullock, learning how to ride horses and rope and shoot and do all the things that a cowboy could do. So Kermit Roosevelt III was here this morning right. and last night. So his great-grandfather was, was sent, not, didn't, wasn't accompanied by TR, but sent by TR mm -hmm. out to work with Seth Bullock for a summer. Yeah. And, and of course, in, in uh, March of 1905, for Roosevelt's inaugural, Seth Bullock took his so-called cowboy brigade uh, to D.C. to ride in the inaugural parade. There's a famous photograph of these cowboys, one of whom in the front row is a young guy named Tom Mix, who was, was, who was later in Medora. 1905, and in 1909 he was married actually in Medora, Tom Mix was, and later that same year made his first movie, and of course became this uh, superstar cowboy movie actor, but uh, Tom Mix was a, actually a workaday cowboy who went with, with Seth Bullock to the Roosevelt uh, uh, inaugural, and of course Tom Mix, not to get off the subject, but Tom Mix, uh, you know, his publicity uh, machine in Hollywood later claimed he was a rough rider and that he uh, charged up San Juan Hill with Roosevelt. And uh, apparently it all stems from this trip he made to the inaugural as one of Seth Bullock's cowboys. So they were all liars. <laughs> <laughs> other, other questions for Doug Ellison, the, the mayor of Medora. Yes. Uh, and the Medora newspapers mentioned Tom Mix and Olive Stokes being in Medora. That, that's the woman he married. And they were there for a few weeks. And yeah, he, uh, in, in the Medora, in the Billings County Museum in Medora, they have uh, copies of Christmas cards and letters that Tom Mix would send to the Short family. Uh, he kept in touch over the years after he became very famous. Uh, he would send the family Christmas greetings every year. And the, the Medora Museum has copies of those on display. Other questions? Yes. Do you know the spot where Tom Mix and his wife were married? Uh, they, they were married by Nels Nichols, who was Justice of the Peace, and I think the Nichols house is, is still there, right? Uh, to, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure, but I, I, think, I think we could determine where, the, where Nels Nichols lived. And I, in fact, his wife wrote a book, Olive Stokes, that is, Olive Stokes Mix wrote a book. And uh, she got the, the marriage date wrong. Uh, in, in, her, in her book, she said her and Tom were married in Medora January 19th. And you can go into the courthouse and the marriage certificate says January 10th. So she got her marriage date wrong. But, um, but she did say they went to the, the home of Nels Nichols. That's where the ceremony took place. And I, I think we could determine where Nels Nichols' home actually was. Over here. Could TR have just shot the thieves? Did someone say, why didn't you just shoot them? What, what were other things that, that might have occurred? Yeah, well, um, you know, as in the case of Calamity, Joe Meyer that we've been talking about, he actually was, uh, you know, he did resist arrest. He was shot in Glen Allen, but, but he was taken bodily to, to jail. Uh, you know, the, the Dakota Territorial Prison was full, and the jails were, were typically full of lawbreakers. Um, the only, the only really uh, uh, hanging spree, so to speak, was the Montana Stranglers. I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, some, some old ranchers would, would ask Roosevelt, well, wouldn't it be just simpler to hang these guys? You know, but Roosevelt, of course, would not have done that, and, and most would not have. But, but if he had, uh, would he have been liable to prosecution? 
I, I think because of his prominence, he probably would have been. The, the Stranglers, of course, even to this day, very few of the Stranglers are known. Uh, uh, their leader uh, was Bill, Bill Cantrell, and he's really the only Strangler we know anything about. Uh, the, the, the Stranglers themselves are still anonymous. Uh, considering Roosevelt's prominence, uh, it would have been hard for him to keep that quiet. He could have said they were resisting arrest. You know, there are stories about lawmen who would shoot their prisoners, and it's, they'd say, oh, they were, they were resisting arrest. They tried to run away. I had to shoot them. Roosevelt, of course, would never have done that. Some lawmen apparently did do that. But uh, uh, I think Roosevelt didn't want to go there. Yes, here. Yeah, yeah. The, the contradiction between wanting to be a vigilante yeah. and then bringing both thieves to justice. That, that's very perceptive, yes. Other questions, yes? Did, did this have any effect on his desire to document his heroics in Cuba? Uh, well, I think it probably did. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, uh, as, well, as Clay mentioned, you know, restaging the photographs. I mean, Roosevelt was very conscious of history and, uh, uh, you know, wanted to record his adventures. And, and maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's understandable that he would embellish, I'll, I'll, I'll use the word embellish, his uh, adventures. Uh, you know, but he, he was, I think, writing for posterity. And... Uh, and, and in something uh, obviously as prominent as the Cuban campaign, uh, you know, he pretty well had to stick to the facts there. There were reporters, for one thing. <laughs> uh, a lot of reporters. There are other questions for Doug Ellison. Am I missing anyone? I have a question about another incident. I hate even to bring it up, but um, <laughs> the, even his biographers, Putnam and Hagedorn, have some trouble with this story, so I'm guessing where this is headed, but that at a meeting of the um, Little Missouri Stockman's Association, he and Willard got into some sort of a conflict and Willard actually put a gun to Roosevelt's ribs and threatened to shoot and Roosevelt said, go ahead, yeah. they're all watching and so on. What about that story? Well, that's a, that's a whole other uh, talk because uh, I've done, done a lot of work on Fred Willard and uh, Hagedorn, Herman Hagedorn, uh, in his book, Roosevelt and the Badlands, his characters are very one-dimensional. You'll notice anyone who's read that uh, Roosevelt is all virtuous. Anyone who disagreed with him is, is evil. Uh, the, the characters are just very one-dimensional. And, and w one of his bad guys was Fred Willard, who he called Joe Maunders. And, and he, he had an, another name for E.G. Paddock. No, uh, I'm, I'm wrong. Paddock uh, was uh, Maunders. Joe Morrell. Right. Fred Willard became Joe Morrell. E.G. Paddock became... Uh, Jake Maunders. Jake Maunders. So Hagedorn had these Medora historic characters under aliases. To protect people and and himself from libel yeah and uh <laughs> but but fred willard uh fred willard was a he it's ironic he and roosevelt were within six months of age of each other and they died within six months of each other um fred willard was was out of the black hills uh he he was a he was a legitimate gunfighter uh in fact uh Everyone knows the significance of February 14, 1884, right? That's when Roosevelt's mother and wife died on the same day under the same roof in New York. That very same day, February 14, 1884, Fred Willard is leading a posse at Stoneville, Montana, which is now Alzada, in one of the bloodiest gunfights in Western history. Uh, five men died as, as a result of this gunfight in, in, at Stoneville with the George Axelby gang. But anyway, that was the, another similarity between Willard and, and Roosevelt is that very same day uh, all this happened. But at any rate, Willard comes up, he becomes deputy marshal in Medora. He was the first lawman in Medora before the county was organized. When the county was organized, he became the first sheriff of Billings County. He elected unanimously. Another thing Hagnorn talks about is uh, uh, they, they pushed this bad element into office. Uh, including the sheriff. Well, the entire ticket was elected unanimously in that first election, so there was no discord. 
uh, despite what Hagedorn says. And uh, Willard and Roosevelt did have uh, a disagreement in 1887 uh, at the Mile City Stockman's meeting. Uh, Fred Willard had gone to Ohio to arrest George Myers, one of Roosevelt's cowboys, on a charge of cattle stealing. The warrant had been sworn out by the Stockman's Association. Well, uh, Willard faced a lot of criticism, not only from uh, Roosevelt, but also from A.T. Packard, editor of the Badlands Cowboy, who had always kind of been on Willard's side before. He excoriated him for taking this pleasure trip to Ohio to arrest George Meyer. He said George would have been back in a couple of weeks anyway. So uh, at the spring meeting the next year, Roosevelt goes to the Stockman's board in Miles City and, and wants uh, Willard removed as stock inspector. It had nothing to do with his lawman uh, position, but as stock inspector. He wanted him removed. And, uh, and they called Willard in. And uh, Willard just, all he said, all that's on record, Willard said, well, it's a personal matter between Mr. Roosevelt and myself. That's all he would say. So what the board did, they basically compromised. They, uh, they didn't fire, they didn't terminate Willard, but they abolished the position. So they, you know, they, they went the middle ground. Uh, but according to Hagedorn, uh, Willard and Roosevelt were bitter, deadly, almost deadly enemies. You know, this gunplay you talked he, about. He pulled a gun on TR. And uh, in 1905, uh, I mentioned this cowboy brigade going to D.C. for the inaugural. One of those men was Fred Willard. And he's quoted in the paper, and they said, he and Roosevelt uh, are old friends, you know, and Willard is direct quote in the newspaper. He said, uh, uh, he said, I have a bit, uh, a, a bridle bit that was given me by by, he called him Teddy, which probably irritated Roosevelt, but he said, given me by Teddy, which, I will, which no money could ever buy. He thought so highly of this bit that Roosevelt had given him. He said, money cannot buy it from me. And uh, he said, the only thing, there was a bit of rivalry there. He said, the only thing Roosevelt could beat me at was boxing. He said, we, he said we would, us boys would put on the gloves from time to time and mix it up. And uh, he said, I, I could never beat him boxing, but he said, I could outride him and outshoot him, but I could never outbox him. But he's, he's talking like old friends. And so I, I think this animosity that Hagedorn built up between Willard and Roosevelt was not there. Uh, at least Willard didn't hold a grudge. In 1905, he's like, uh, Teddy and I are great friends. We have time for one more if someone has one. Yes, here. Oh, Hagedorn, you're saying, has a novel about Cuba that's not factual oh. at all. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, do you know the name of the book? I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. So, yeah. what, Doug, let me, I mean, uh, we have to close here, but this has been such a interesting and disturbing talk. But <laughs> um, I mean, disturbing for all sorts of reasons. I mean, of course, we love our mythology of Roosevelt, and you live in a city that is given over to the mythologies of, of Roosevelt and, and the West. But, but secondly, I mean, if you're right, and it sounds like you are, I'm sure you aren't, but I mean, <laughs> but, but it sounds like you are. You're a good historian and you've done your research. And, uh, if you're right, and I mean this seriously, if so many of these stories, that there's no Libby Slim, that he never arrested Calamity Joe, that this incident with Willard didn't occur, etc., then that says something important, that in his autobiography, which was not a letter to John Hay, you know, a letter to John Hay, you can see maybe he wants to make up some whoppers, but mm -hmm. in his autobiography, which, by the way, a, a citizen of Grand Forks disputes on a minor fact, if he's willing to commit these mythologies, these lies, in books and in articles that he wrote for Century and Scribner's and other magazines, then this would force us from a historiographical point of view to doubt any number of stories that Roosevelt tells about his time in the West. Because, for example, the story about the gunslinger and Weibo, it's a great story, but imagine punching out a guy with two pistols in his hands. I mean, it, it, these stories have, a, have a, a kind of frontier dime novel feel to them. And you're saying that stories that can be tracked down turn out to be untrue or heavily embellished. So 
this means that we have to be more skeptical, don't we, of all of these stories? Well, uh, skepticism is, is good from a historic viewpoint. I think if you're recording history, you should be skeptical. And uh, an another thing with the, the Weibo incident, uh, again, I, I, I can't dispute his story. There's no evidence to dispute his story other than the fact, perhaps, that Roosevelt says he walks into this bar room and here's a, here's a bar room full of Dakota cowboys and sheep herders terrorized by this drunk with a couple of guns. And uh, I, uh, it just seems to me like uh, I don't think uh, one guy could have cowed an entire saloon of, of, of uh, patrons, you know, waiting for TR to come in and save the day. But maybe, I, maybe I'm too skeptical. I don't well, know. Let me just, first of all, let me say two things. First of all, thank you for giving a really provocative and spectacular um, lecture, which I think is really going to to force us all to do some rethinking. And secondly, you'll never be back. That's it. <laughs> you'll, you'll never be back. Doug Ellison, the, the mayor of Medora.